Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. It's been almost a full year since Bobby Bostick walked out of a Missouri prison on November 9, 2022. Bostick was just 16 years old when he committed a robbery in 1995, the crime that led to a staggering 241-year sentence. Bostick's freedom came because of a new Missouri law which made him eligible for his first parole hearing after more than 25 years in prison. Instead of dying behind bars, he's now learning to live and thrive outside them. For Bostick, that's meant more than just learning how to use the internet or maintaining an apartment. He's been catching up on what he's missed and finding ways to give back. And Bobby's here today to talk with us about his first year of freedom. Bobby, welcome back to St. Louis on the Air. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So part of what you've been doing since you left prison on parole is running writing workshops for kids in three juvenile detention centers in Missouri. And two weeks ago, there was an essay published that you wrote on the Marshall Project website, and it describes your work in those centers. What has that experience been like, Bobby? Um, it's been a learning experience, and it also been a challenging experience. By me have been in two of those juveniles, one of them several times, Hogan Street twice. So for me to sit in the very seats that those juveniles sat in, it brings everything home of what was I thinking when I was sitting in those seats. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, what can I do different? What can I teach them different that will make them make better decisions than I did when I was sitting in those very seats they sit in? Yeah, so by that, do you mean that you were in the same centers when you were a teenager? Yeah, I was in Hogan Street in 94, 93, mm -hmm. and I was in Vanda Vanda Enright um, too many times for me to remember. Okay. Truancy, just petty crimes, go, uh, not going to school. They used to take you to detention center for that stuff. Yeah. So what are these kids like, the ones that you're seeing now? I mean, do they remind you of yourself as a child or even moments when you've been an adult? Oh yeah, they remind me exactly of myself, especially at their age because of how they think and what I see a lot of potential there. I see a lot of hope and promise there. And that's the part that I try to tap into, like, because if, if you tap into their anger, then that's what they'll gravitate towards. I tap into the hope that they got and the potential to let them know that they can do anything that they put their mind to and it starts now. They don't have to you can do four years in high school or you can do 40 years in prison. Which one would you rather do? Yeah. I would rather stay in school. And I, I tell them that, like, this is how you, be, if you want to be an illegal hustler, hustler, turn that around and become a legal entrepreneur. Uh, do everything legal and above the board so you won't have to go to prison. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to get money the right way. Yeah. How much do they know about your background, Bobby? Is that something that they learn from you directly, or is it introduced to them before you even get to meet them face-to-face? -face? If it ain't introduced to them, I, I make sure I do it every class because it's 15 juveniles per class, but out of that one group, every week it'll at least be one or two new people in there because somebody else got released or was transferred to another institution. So... Um, every week it's two or three individuals, so I got to reiterate my story. And every time I reiterate it, even though you heard it before, it still says something in their mind, like, man, this dude had 241 years. And I'm like, look, this, this is what can possibly happen to you if you don't take this advice, not from a staff member or somebody who went to school from it and didn't live it. This is somebody who lived in the same cells that you're living in now. And I went right from these cells to prison. When you tell them that you had a 241-year sentence, how do these youth react? It's always so, wow, did he say 24 or did he say 241? It's like a, a mouth drop thing, like, you know, because it's like who can comprehend that type of number? 
241. I'm like, yeah, man, I left right from where you sitting at, certified as adult, and I was given 241 years. They're like, man, how can they do that? Okay, because right now, today, they, as a law stand in Missouri, you still can be sentenced to 241 years. Mm. It can happen to you as I'm speaking, so I'm letting y'all know that you're not uh, an exception to the rule. There's many people that sit in prison. Uh, some of these kids got wounds. They done been through trauma. They done witnessed people getting killed in their family. They done witnessed friends being shot. Uh, some of them been abused, neglected. They done, So they need healing. And a writing workshop in itself is not long enough period of healing for them. So my workshop purpose is to, to mold their mind into their true potential. That's why I teach um, business, how to write business plans, how to write essays. So I just teach them that writing uh, resumes, and then the ones who get out, if their mother in touch with me, she'll call me and say, look, he needs a job. Can you take him to an interview? And I follow up, take him to jobs, go check on him, take him clothes. So the work is not just in juvenile. It continues with me after they are released in juvenile as well. And one of the things that really stood out from the, the Marshall Project essay that you published recently is a question that you got from one of your students. And given all of the things that they're facing, that they're up against, the student asked, why should I write about changing the world when the world doesn't care about me? Bobby, how did you respond to that? What did you tell him? I told him that he should write about the world. He should write about his condition to the world, or he should write about changing the world so the world can start caring about him. And when I said that, it hit home to him like a ton of bricks because it made sense. Um, I was telling him why he should write to change the world, and he challenged me with, your, with the question you just asked me, why should I write about changing the world when the world doesn't care about me? I said you should write about the world, changing the world, so the world can care about you. Maybe the world knew what you was going through, maybe they would care. Because if they don't care, then there's an African proverb that says that the child that doesn't feel loved by the village will burn the village down to feel its warmth. And when the child wants to feel the warmth of a village, it means that it's trying to feel the love of the, of the village. Many children feel neglected by society, and that's why they take on the me against the world mentality and feeling like they don't have nothing to lose, even though they may have a love and two-parent home mm-hmm. and a love and extended family, but they still don't feel love, and they turn to the streets. And so we trying to keep them from the streets, and we trying to guide them to a different path. Yeah. So, Bobby, you grew up during an era uh, that was marked by the crack ep- epidemic, and that was when politicians were talking about super predators. Now, kids are facing a school-to-prison pipeline. What do you see that is different for these kids compared to what was going on back in the 80s and 90s? And is there anything that is familiar that sort of crosses over? Um, yeah, as far as, what, as far as the reflection in the 80s and 90s, um, the, what's missing from that is the, the sense of commun- community cohesiveness when um, a child was allowed to be disciplined by other parents, a sense of community where other parents cared about kids. And as they say, history repeats itself, so some things remain the same from the 70s, 80s, um, early 90s. But what we're missing most of all is the cohesiveness cohesiveness of the community and the village helping raise that child because a parent can raise the child, but the school is an extension of the parent when the child is away from home. So a teacher can't be a parent, of course, but... Uh, the school still got to take on more of an uh, internal, maternal, fraternal nature because they are an extension of parents. When the parents send the children to school, the school is being entrusted with the child's upbringing, which makes the school somewhat responsible for that child. So uh, the school administration just got to be more warmer towards the children the way that the teachers was warm towards us. Mm-hmm. When you came out and saw what the conditions are around 
schools and uh, communities and the care that kids were not receiving, what did that make you feel about um, what you could do to make things better? Um, first of all, in my book, in my autobiography, Humble to the Dust Till I Rise, which was just released last month or so, that book, in that book I explained that as a child, the St. Louis Public Schools teacher was the most current individuals that I had ever ran across in my life because they gave me food out of my pocket, I mean out of their pocket, um, money out of their pocket to buy food. They did things for me. They went beyond above duty, and they gave me things that I know that probably they couldn't afford, but they saw a child in need, and they extended their heart to me. I don't know if teachers do that now today, but those current gestures are something that you never forget. There's a saying that you may, they say that you may not, uh, you'll never remember what somebody said, but you'll never forget how they made you feel. Mm. And those teachers, they didn't talk bad to us kids that was bad. They just didn't understand why we was acting the way that we was acting. But what they did made the difference. And what they did is they cared for us. And it's like, man, these people really care. So let me open up to this teacher. Let me care about this teacher. Where does this teacher care about me? And kids want that care. And when they feel like they're missing that, that's when they start rebelling, rebelling against society and create their own subculture. Mm-hmm. As I was plan- explaining in my book, us as teenagers, we felt that society was rejecting us. So we rejected society. We created our own subculture. We created our own form of sign language, which was gang signs, but that was our way of communicating. We created our own subculture of dress. Uh, we create our own subculture of everything. Everything society shut us out on. We rebelled and created our own subculture. Mm-hmm. And when I see kids doing it today, it's like, oh man, that's us again. Yeah. But I can relate to them because I am of them because I went straight from prison to freedom mm-hmm. from juvenile to prison, and I still know how they think. And by me knowing that, I just want to offer them something different. Yeah. So this latest book that you have written again, is titled Humble to Dust, Still I Rise. And it's a memoir that goes from your childhood to your release from prison last year. And I I do say latest because, Bobby, you've written more than 10 books. What is it that this book means to you? Um, Altogether, I wrote 15 books. Um, Eight of them is on Amazon. This book here is the book because... Uh, The media have told the story, other people have told the story, and I have told bits and pieces of it here and there, but I knew a long time ago I was going to have to write this because people want to know, like, how did you endure 27 years in prison? How do you possibly write write books from prison? How did you go to college from prison? And in my autobiography, I explain step-by-step every question that they asked me from my birth on up till the last six months after my release. And that was a book that was demanding to be completed because if anybody trying to help you get out of prison, help you with other life goals, et cetera, et cetera, they want to know your background, what was you thinking. So that book is to let people know, like, look, this is the world, this is his problem, here go the solution, though. And the people like me that was part of the other problem, we had the best solution. So let us get a seat at the table and try to help correct the, rectify the wrongs we have done, amend form and atone for those things, and do our part to help and better the St. Louis community. Mm-hmm. We're speaking with Bobby Bostick, who was released on parole from prison after spending 27 years behind bars for a crime that he committed when he was 16. Uh, and We are now talking almost a year out from his release and now discussing his first book published post-release. Bobby, how did it feel to hold the book in your hands, this particular one? This book was a long time in coming. Um, For the people who order this book, which is available in the St. Louis Public Library or Amazon or any bookstore nationwide, when you order the book and start reading towards the end and get to the epilogue, you back when I wrote this book, I, I wrote it back in 13 and completed it. But the story wasn't complete yet because it took 10 more years of writing. 
because as I finished, I had to add the last 10 years on in my life from 2013 to 2023. And the book kept uh, taking different turns, and I would think this to end, and then something else would happen. And the way that God and the universe worked it out perfect was that it was eight months after I was released that I finished the last chapter or the last part of the epilogue, meaning that this is what I'm doing I heard in the first eight months mm -hmm. in. And now it, it got a happy ending. The first it would have been just me publishing a book with a guy stuck in prison, but the way the universe worked it out was like, now you can tell the world your victory of what you're doing in out here in freedom, how you living, all the things that you're doing, all the places that you visit. And people smile at that like, okay, he went through all that, but now in the end he can see the world, he can travel, he can, he can hold his nieces and nephews, he's free. There's something very beautiful about that, that you are, you are the author of your life in, in a very uh, particular and poignant way. Now, there's a passage in your book that is really striking and heartbreaking as well. In it, you're looking out of your prison window and describing what you see outside. Could you read that passage for us, Bobby? Um, to give you all a backdrop on this passage, I'm in solitary confinement in 2020. Um, for something, something petty, but I had to do 40 days. Um, I was stuck in solitary confinement, and as a writer, I reflect on everything that I see around me. And prison, you get a window sometime when you're in the cell, locked in the cell 24 hours. I was stuck in the cell for 40 days, 24 hours a day, so I was looking out the window, and this is what I saw. And I wrote it as I saw it. More birds fly nearby and perch on the barbed wire fence. I marvel at them. They actually curl their feet around the barbed wire every day without getting cut. Yet if I so much as graze this barbed wire, it will rip through my flesh as the high voltage electric security fence shocks me into oblivion. These small baby birds walk past on the grass with tiny pieces of bread in their beak that someone has left out for them to eat. The grass is freshly cut and looks so soft, but my, my bare feet have not touched grass since I have been incarcerated. The sun is shining bright outside. I look into the distance at the highway and see cars zooming by with people going to their various destinations. Even trains whiz by with car after car. After a while of looking, my eyes get blurred as I sit back on my bunk feeling defeated. According to the courts, I will never f be free in that world again. And the words, um, it rips through your soul. That That's a hard feeling when a grown man look out his window and he see a bird. And all he can see is the birds are free and he's not. And it's like, would I want to be a bird? No, I'm, I'm a man, so I got to take responsibility. But now... I look out and I see that I'm trapped in the cell with barbed wire fence and I can't see nothing but birds and they walking on the grass. I think about the grass. I can never, they walking barefoot on the grass. My feet will never touch grass according to the courts. The sun is shining bright outside, but what does it mean when I'm stuck in the cell and I can't go nowhere? Mm -hmm. Everybody going to their destinations, even train cars. And that, that, that just made me right then and there, I had to write that passage. You described what situation you were in, that 40 days of solitary confinement, and that was in 2020, which was a particularly difficult time from what I understand. What exactly was happening during that period, Bobby? Uh, um, during the time that I wrote this, this passage in, in my autobiography, in 2020, we was gathering hundreds tens of thousands of signatures and we was trying to get a clemency but where it was that there was no clemency to be given it was freezing outside and in prison when it's freezing outside it's even colder in the cell because there's no layer of protection so I was sitting in the freezing cell and while you being that cold it makes you move around a lot and you go back from the bunk to the window and just look out the window so Bobby, what did putting 
these thoughts and feelings down on paper do for you? Um, writing is healing. It's, it's artistic in the sense that art helps you heal in a way that um, a human being don't understand unless he does it. I found meaning in my existence through writing. Um, the more I wrote, the more I discovered. If I asked myself a question, wrote the question down, and then tried to answer it in writing, I found the answer, writing showed me the way in the sense that I would answer my question through pen and paper, read what I wrote, and then find the answer in what I wrote because it made sense. Like, this is what the question that you asked. Where is the answer? I do a little research, and then I write what I what I researched into an answer form, and then my question is answered, and I find healing in what I discovered through my research and my writing. And that's the power of writing and what it did for me, and that's why, that's primarily the reason why I go and do writing workshops. Maybe I can go in there and teach them how to play games or how to play basketball, but that that was never what worked for me. What got me through prison is reading and writing. So the reason I go into the juvenile detention centers is to give the kids the gift of reading and writing. And when I tell them about 241 years and how it came from here to now, that's where the book comes into play in the juvenile detention center. The kids that I teach, I want to get them my book so you can, so I can say, here go my life story, man. This is the path I went. Led me to 241 years. And this is, if, if that was an extreme sentence, I had to make an extreme change in my life to get to the point of being free. And this is the life I'm living now. Mm -hmm. Which life would you prefer? Here's the life story. Not what you heard from somebody else. This is my life story here. Here go the book. And when they read the book, then it makes sense of why 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 am I here teaching these writing workshops? They understand like this this he's he's not getting paid for this. He doesn't do it to look down on us or to tell us nothing that he haven't lived. He's talking about these same cells we lived in in this book. He's talking about the same streets that we were on. This guy speaking from his heart. And by him speaking from his heart, it makes them know that I got skin in this. I'm not just talking. I'm living. I'm a live. Um, I'm a lived example of the life that they live in, and the path that they could go to if they do something different, or the way that it's gonna happen if they do something different. And the passion come out every time. Every class that I teach, the passion come out, and that's what makes them relate. Like he's in here because he cares, and and. Kids want to be cared about. No matter how tough we is in the streets and all that, we still got a human side of us. And the bravado, we don't want to show that, but it's still there. We still human underneath all that because, for instance, if I wasn't human underneath all that, I wouldn't have changed my life and be giving back to them when I'm giving back to them. So mm -hmm. um, it comes full circle when I teach those classes. It's a moment of something I discover every week when I do it. It's like, man, uh, Maybe if I'd have listened or somebody would have came here like like me back then, maybe my life would have been different. But in the 90s, they didn't let people like me with criminal records come around and teach a writing workshop. That was unheard of. And for me, I didn't have no, no pioneers or examples before me. I didn't know a single soul. I didn't know nobody. It was just an original idea like, man, if I ever get out, I'm going to go to the juvenile detention center and teach what I know best, writing workshops. Mm -hmm. These books heal me. When I wrote these books, it was a healing experience. So I want to teach. I want to get that same healing back to the, to these juveniles. Mm -hmm. So the last time you were here talking with us was shortly after you were released on parole. Now that we are about a year from that time, Bobby, what has surprised and delighted you most about being free in that world that you had written about and that you're living in now? Uh, well, in a sense, freedom is like a child. It's like being a baby and a child again. When you see the world all over, it's new. Everything is new. What Everything that's old to other people out here is all new to me. And it's still happening to this very day. It's like a year later and the world's still new. Just as I'm sitting here now, I'm looking at um, the architect of a building. That's new to me. Everything is new. It's like this the city I grew up in, but everything is new. The people is new. Um, just every day, food is new. And it, that feeling, I don't know if that'll ever leave me because 
that's something that you will never take for granted is freedom. Mm-hmm. So back near the beginning of 2023, you wrote again for the Marshall Project, and you said that you felt like a, a newborn at the time. So now that you're close to that one-year anniversary of leaving prison, do you feel like you're at least like at toddler status? I mean, is there maybe one way that your loved ones can see that you've grown up in the last year? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they see that because now I'm paying my own. Well, I got to pay my own car, my car insurance. I got to pay light, electric, gas. I got to pay my car insurance, uh, rent. I got to pay, I got to buy my own clothes. I got to feed myself. Um, but that one thing about the uh, the infant stage is that even when you become an adult, you still got that childhood essence. Mm-hmm. You you see it in adults when they go certain places. That's something that we should never lose. So me personally, even though I can show that I grew up and I'm not an infant no more in freedom, I'm still at a baby stage. A one-year-old, he's still trying to discover the world. A one-year-old just learning to walk and talk and cry. I'm still learning to walk and talk and cry on my freedom journey because I've only been out a year. So I'm just like that one-year-old in my freedom journey, I'm just learning to walk and talk again as a free man. Bobby Bostick is a writer, poet, and educator. He's been named as one of the Cranzburg Arts Foundation's 2024 resident artists. You can catch him performing November 14th at the Word Up Open Mic. Bobby, thank you so much for coming in today to talk with us. I appreciate it. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.